Hi, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. Longtime viewers will probably remember a holder I had in my old shop for holding paper towels and toilet paper within easy reach of the workbench. That old holder was visible in almost every video I did in the old shop, and I've really missed having those within easy reach for the two and a half years since I moved out of that shop, and I never reinstalled this old holder in this shop. So it's been a long time, but I'm overdue for an upgrade. And this is the upgrade that I made to the old unit. This one was just paper towels on a piece of closet pole, and it worked fine. But now that they make these new ratcheting mechanisms, it helps to roll from spinning when you pull off a sheet. So it's a lot handier to have because I can easily use it one-handed in the shop. Of course, I could have just screwed these dispensers to the side of my tool cabinet, but that's for entry-level carpentry, and I felt I better take this to the next level. What you'll see in the build is making this board, which is routine, and then I've got two dispensers, and something unique about that is that they both came this length, and I modified this one to be shorter to hold a single roll of toilet paper, which is a little bit of a trick, but I think it looks better than that. To make it worth your while to watch the build, I'll also show you how to make this sturdy French cleat arrangement for the back of the holder. And the thing about that is it bolts to the side of the cabinet through the holes that normally hold the lifting handle. So I don't have to corrupt the cabinet with a bunch of holes screwed in there or even a few holes screwed in there to mount this board. In case I ever decide to relocate the board, I don't want those nasty holes in the side of a nice cabinet. So the build gets a little more involved than putting varnish on a board and screwing a couple of ratcheting holders to it. And it can be a little bit surprising how many there's steps there is to a little build like that. So we better get to it. I chose two of these stainless steel paper towel holders for their design, sturdiness, and the fact that they can be taken apart and modified. You can see the ratcheting action that prevents unraveling here. The holders come with a couple lame wall plug anchors and useless screws tucked inside the box. So I file them for use. Never. I made a mounting panel for the towel holders out of some cool looking ash from Perfect Pallet Runners. Amazing how nice this stuff looks, right? With strips milled and glued, I can trim one end of the panel on the table saw. I check this first trimming cut for square, then mark and cut the panel to length at 24 inches. An Osborne EB3 miter gauge makes these cuts manageable, safe, and square. Viewers are sometimes surprised that I don't insist on biscuits or dominoes for edge-to-edge -edge glue ups like this. But as you can see with this joint stress test demonstration, the glue joint, without extra measures, is always stronger than the wood itself. To embellish the corners of the mounting panel with accenting curves, I drill out a scrap block of the cutoff panel material using a three inch Forstner bit in the drill press. This is the method I use anytime I'm drilling a large hole without a center point to stabilize the Forstner bit. To finish this partial arc drilling guide block, I carefully cut out a corner of the drilled block on the table saw using a sacrificial fence on a miter guide. The second cut is a bit too dicey to hold by hand, so I use a deep reach squeeze clamp to hold the piece and preserve my pinkies. Because I didn't have a thicker piece of scrap handy, I used Starbond CA glue to add a couple spacer blocks to the back face of the block, then cut and drill them flush with the block for use. With the block complete, I used a couple clamps to hold it securely to corners of the mounting panel. Now the block guides the large Forstner bit, so it can cut a smooth curved notch with only part of the bit's circumference. Without the guide block, this cut would be a disaster, but with it, I easily get a nice, classy accent for the panel. And it doesn't take long to notch all four corners. To get the cove profile I want for the panel, I use a three-quarter inch cove routing bit with a little hack that makes the look of the cove more subtle and classy, in my humble opinion. The hack involves switching the standard half-inch diameter guide bearing for a three-eighths diameter one so that the cove ends on a tangent at the edges of the panel. I also use a shallow setting, about a quarter inch deep, rather than the full three-quarter inch depth the bit is capable of. I run this modified cove profile on a piece of scrap to make sure I like the proportion before running it all around the panel. I really prefer the look of this hack profile compared to the look of a full 90-degree cove normally produced with this type of bit. 
Next, I take measurements from the side of the toolbox and lay out for the large but shallow mortise needed to accommodate the French cleat I used to hang this panel on the toolbox. The mortise will be stepped with part of it at 1 8 inch deep and part of it at 3 8 inches deep. I use a routing template to make the mortise, so I cut pieces of 3 quarter inch thick scrap to length and use Starbond Accelerator and their thick CA glue to quickly assemble a perfectly squared rectangular routing template 5 and a half inches by 8 and a half inches. I tack a strip of scrap to the back of the panel to act as a template alignment guide for the mortising process. Now I can clamp the routing template in place and maintain alignment during the routing process. The mortise needs to be the right depth for the steel plate for the French cleat, so I lay out pieces of 8 inch thick steel and cut them to length on a Milwaukee dry cut saw. This is kind of a scary machine, but it does a great job of cutting steel plate with ease. Very noisy ease, but it's quick, clean, and square. The cuts are clean and square, but because the saw blade is getting old, I use an 80 grit flap disc and a 5 inch Metabo grinder to quickly deburr all the cut edges for a nice smooth finish. To route the mortise, I'll use a 5 8 inch diameter top bearing flush trim bit. I use a scrap of the template material and a piece of steel plate to set the bit depth for the 1 8 inch deep part of the mortise. I start by routing once around the inside of the template and then, the router from tipping, drop in a scrap of template material to support the router base as I clean out the center of this large open mortise. I switch to a smaller chunk of template as I complete this routing step. Now I scribe and cut a piece of scrap to the full depth of the template and mortise to support the router base when completing the 1 8 inch deep part of the mortise. I've repositioned the template, so I drop in the scrap block and finish up the 1 8 inch deep mortise over the full area for the French cleat. Part of the mortise needs to be 3 8 of an inch deep, clear mounting bolts, so I reset the router bit using a piece of scrap. As I start routing, I notice that the bit collet is protruding below the router base plate and burning the edge of the template. So I stop, lower the bit a bit, reset the bit depth, and proceed with routing this area of the mortise to the full 3 8 inch depth. I use the same support block as before to keep the bottom of the mortise flat. It's a bit tricky to keep the router from tipping, but with a bit of focus, I get it done, leaving the deep part of the mortise 5 and a half inches wide by 8 and a half inches long at 3 8 of an inch deep. Now a puff of compressed air clear shavings out and, with the template removed, you can see how the French cleat steel pieces fit nicely into this mortise. To make the French cleat, I first use a flat disc to remove mill scale from one 4 inch wide piece of steel and put a slight but smooth rounded bevel on one edge of the inch and a half wide piece of steel. This narrow piece needs to lap over the wide piece by a half inch, so I draw a line and use vice grips to hold the pieces in alignment. There's not a lot of stress on this connection, so a few short beads of weld are plenty strong enough to hold the narrow strip to the wide one. Because I'm more impatient than tough, I take the hot pieces of welded steel outside and quickly quench it in our mid-October snowfall so I can keep on working without burning my fingers. Since I'll use existing bolt holes to attach the French cleat to the toolbox, I remove the toolbox handle so you can see how the steel gets positioned. Next, I lay out the cleat for handle bolt hole locations, so everything is oriented how it needs to be for final installation. A quick wrap on a center punch will help with hole locating when using this old Whitney punch for making quick, clean holes. There's a nib on the punch that I index with the dimple from the center punch, then with firm force on the handle, easily punch clean holes 5 16 of an inch in diameter through this 8 inch thick steel plate. Unfortunately, the throat of this punch isn't deep enough to reach the second row of holes, so I have to resort to a regular drill bit off camera for those two. Back at the panel, I lay out a series of holes on the other 4 inch flat plate for small screws that will fasten it to the back of the mounting panel. I center punch these too for alignment. After switching the die and punch in the Whitney punch, I make quick work of punching 8 holes 9 64 inch in diameter through the 8 inch thick steel. I just love this punch. I could have done a better job of aligning punch with dimples and have to ignore OCD tendencies that irritate me with slightly misaligned holes. These small dimpled plugs are what the punch makes with its incredible compound leverage that pushes a blunt steel peg through solid steel. Pretty cool if you ask me. I still have to make an oily mess when I countersink the eight small holes so flathead screws sit flush with the plate, but it can't be avoided. 
Oh well, lacquer thinner easily washes cutting oil off the steel to minimize the mess it makes. And you can see here how handle bolt holes align and the French cleat fits together. Next, I use a VIX bit for pilot hole for the number 7 by 3 quarter inch flathead Phillips screws that hold the flat plate to the back of the mounting panel and run a few of those screws in to attach the plate for now. The other part of the cleat gets fastened to the toolbox by reusing the four handle bolts. But when I go to show off how great this homemade hardware works, the bolt heads prevent the cleat from engaging and the panel drops with an embarrassing crash. All it took to provide adequate clearance for the bolt heads was a small 45 degree bevel along the bottom of the mortise. And now the mounting panel drops positively and firmly into position, just like it's supposed to. There's a little side to side play in the panel, which makes it simple to center it on the toolbox. You gotta love it when a plan comes together, right? Now you can see how the holders will be positioned on the mounting panel, but there's a problem. TP is much narrower than PT, so I need to modify one of the holders to shorten it for a better fit. One of the reasons I chose this brand and style of holder is that it can be taken apart. So first I mark the width of a roll on the center tube. Next, the end knob unscrews and a firm pull removes the end ring and four spring wires from the holder. The center tube is thin stainless steel so a pipe cutter easily cuts it cleanly to length. I do a quick check to make sure the new length will be good. There's a small plug in the end of the pipe with bolt threads sticking out that holds the end cap onto the tube, so I drive this out with a dowel. I use a deburring tool to clean out the end of the tube and then carefully drive the end plug into the shortened tube. This next part is a bit tricky. I need to shorten the spring wires and reshape the bend. After a bit of experimenting, I found that using lineman's pliers for cutting and a pair of bending pliers for reshaping, it's less difficult than it looks to modify the wires to fit the shorter TP roll. Once the wires are cut and bent to shape, I clamp them in a vise to kink and flatten the cut ends to the right shape for reassembly. A bit of filing cleans up the ends so they can slip back into holes in the plastic roll ring. Thankfully, with all the parts modified, reassembly is a pain-free process. The end cap sets tension for the ratcheting mechanism and, with a little adjustment, the spindle easily spins as tissues are pulled off the roll. I mark the top of the mounting panel for reference before removing it, take it to the table and then locate, mark, drill pilot holes and screw the paper towel holder into place. With full rolls on both holders, I locate and attach the TP dispenser to the mounting board too. Both holders are positioned perfectly, so with a quick look at the cleat hardware on the back of the panel, I drop the completed assembly into place for a final test fit. And no crash this time. With the build part complete, I remove the assembly and then unscrew all the hardware from it for the finishing process. I start by scraping and sanding the edges, going through grits ending up with 150 grit for this stage. End grain is always tougher, so I start with a 120 grit belt on a best block for demanding sanding to remove saw marks without rounding over any edges. Then I finish these edges to 150 grit too. After initially scraping with a sharp putty knife, a PVC pipe sanding block starting with 100 grit and finishing with 150 grit sandpaper cleans up the coved corners without too much trouble. Once the edges are done, I reposition the panel and sand all the coves using a smaller diameter PVC pipe that fits the cove contour and use both 100 grit and 150 grit sandpaper to clean up router marks. A small square of 150 grit sandpaper and finger pressure cleans up the coved corner profile without too much fuss either. To finish up prep work, I use an oops eraser to remove layout marks and a sharp putty knife to scrape the flat panel surface. With that done, 150 grit paper on a hard sanding block is all it takes to clean up residual mill marks on the face of this panel. Most of you know how much I hate sanding, so you can be assured that this is the quickest, fastest, least painful set of steps I know of for this process. I switch to 320 grit sandpaper and give everything a good going over to remove the 150 grit scratch and give the entire panel the silky smooth feel it needs before applying the finish. The only thing that gets me through the arduous sanding process is anticipation of applying gel varnish to a piece like this. I'm using Old Master's Gel Poly Varnish in the clear satin sheen for the piece, and the first wipe makes all the prep worthwhile. You just gotta love the way dull sanded wood comes alive with this finish. 
I slather on as much as the wood will absorb, wiping and re-wiping until the surface has a uniform appearance. As the finish starts to thicken, I switch to a clean paper towel and buff all the excess off, leaving a very smooth feel to the piece. A bit of compressed air blows thick wet varnish out of nooks, crannies and holes where a final wipe with the dry towel leaves a uniform sheen all over so I can leave the piece to dry for a good 12 to 24 hours. To keep bare steel from ever rusting, it gets a final cleaning with lacquer thinner followed by a good scuff with 150 grit sandpaper to smooth things up. By placing the metal pieces on drying strips, back side up, I can give them a tack coat of primer on both sides without having to wait for each side to dry before flipping. After half an hour of drying, I use a purple Scotch-Brite pad to scuff the primer and then, back side first, give the pieces a full wet coat of gray primer. If you don't know this, paint doesn't stick to metal very well by itself, but primer does. Primer doesn't wear well, but paint does, so I use primer to stick to the metal and paint to protect the primer. Closely following the steps you see used here will give a remarkably good looking and durable finish to any metal project you need to do. Once the primer is good and dry, it gets scuffed too to remove dust and nibs before the parts get a tack coat of gloss black spray paint. For best results, do edges first before filling in easy to spray faces. My haste in spraying these parts leaves slight lines on the back faces that don't bother me. But if you're more OCD than me, just let each face dry completely before flipping to coat the second sides. After suitable drying time, I give the parts a full wet coat of the gloss black too. Edges and back sides first, and then edges again and a full wet coat on the front facing faces last. Remember to invert the can and spray until the nozzle is clear. Then, with the can still inverted, put the cap on and store the can upside down. It will last literally for decades if you follow this simple sequence. When the varnish is completely dry, use a piece of brown paper bag to buff the finish to give it a wonderfully smooth feel and even sheen. The black pieces stick a little from rushing the painting process, but the only marks on them are on the back faces where they'll never be seen. Except by thousands of viewers on YouTube, that is. Well, I guess that goes to show you that there's a lot of steps to even a simple build like this. But now that the gel poly is dry and buffed and the spray paint is all done and dried, all that remains is final assembly. Since I've done all my homework and everything's been pre-assembled, at this stage all I need to do is put everything back together in reverse order to finish the build. And a build like this goes better with the right tools and equipment. So make sure to check out links in the video description for all the tools and products you see in the video under the Amazon Influencers link if you can't find the stuff locally. And of course, no project is complete without a signature and a date. And I'll call that a wrap. If you like this sort of a build project, I hope you'll subscribe to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. Of course, it's free, and your subscription will help me towards the goal of 250,000 subscribers by the end of 2020. And I appreciate it. And I'll take this opportunity to thank everyone who goes above and beyond to support this channel by becoming a patron through Patreon. Everybody on this list has made a pledge of support to the channel, and it helps me offset the cost of producing videos like this. And to express my appreciation for that above and beyond support, all these active patrons have access to a growing library of patron-only video content. And those patron-only videos include behind-the-scenes stuff from the shop and from the job site. So if you're interested in that, check out the link to Patreon in the description below. In the description, you'll also find links to an Amazon Influencers page with special tools and products from this video as well as a whole bunch of others. And as an influencer, Amazon wants me to let you know that small ad fees are paid to the channel for purchases made through those links, even though anything you buy is the same low online cost you expect. Whether or not you go to this extent to have toilet paper and paper towels available in your shop while you're working, I think that you'll find it handy and worth the effort and the time it takes to put them within easy reach of your workbench. If you've watched to this point in the video, You'll notice that there's a little empty space on the side of that board. Uh, that's not an accident. Something's going to get mounted there, and I'll show you that in a future video. It's another equally useful and handy 
thing to have around, but as near as I can tell, it's quite uncommon. So stay tuned for a video when I get to showing you what that is. But in the meantime, as always, to everyone everywhere, thanks for watching. Of course, I might have produced this months earlier, but with all the toilet paper issues we've had in 2020, I'm lucky to get it done even now.